did last uh, last night. The the Harvest Festival. Uh, got a few picks coming up, I guess. I didn't realize I had any picks. I have a video. Charlotte, I couldn't get the video to play. It was too long. It was so awesome. I had a nice video with kind of like a music video. It was really cool. But um, any other picks? Do we have any others? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, anyway, I'm sorry. I'm going to show you more pics, and we'll try to get our video up. But but uh, it was just amazing uh, what happened. So the Harvest Festival, you know, has happened for Charlotte has head that up. Pardo, which who's here with us today, head that, head that up for like 56 years. No, no, it wasn't that long. Uh, <laughs> how many years? 22 years that she has head that up. So uh, COVID came to our town and said, well, you won't do it this year. Well, we showed COVID. That's right. So, so we did a trunk or treat. And, 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 and oh, I just wish I could have that video. I'll get it up next week. I'll show you. And many of you were there either serving. Uh, Brent and Stacy were there serving. And, and, and the Hua family, Josh and Deidre, uh, uh, and, and, and eight other, um, six other different tr- trunks. And, and, and here's the deal. Um, um, sometimes, uh, this is why I was so proud of it. One, I'm proud that our community came out. I think we had over 300 children. Right, we counted over 300 children. Uh, that's not counting parents, so uh, we, we don't want to count them. But, um, but, um, but what happened is, it, what, see, it, this is how God works. Please catch this. Uh, silence the gospel? No, we're going to find ways to say it even more. 300 children heard eight different gospel stories, God bi- biblical stories, one at a time, one at a time. So you couldn't get lost in the confusion of the games. You got a chance to stop and hear it and then be blessed by people that believe in God and loved you. And, and, and I was at the exit uh, part of the time off and on, and, and, and just the joy that was in the people that were leaving, I, I, it, was, it was visible. It was, I heard them, thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing this. So God showed up last night because of you, because of this church, and because of the churches in our community. And, and so I just wanted to praise God for that. Also, uh, uh, you, you would want to praise God for, uh, remember last week, uh, um, uh, uh, Roger Christmer uh, was with us. We prayed for him because he had a major um, brain surgery uh, right on the stem of his brain. Uh, they took a tumor out. Um, I was got got a chance to see him. Um, 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 Shauna and uh, Nora uh, took him up to the to the hospital on Friday morning. By Saturday morning, he was up and walking. And uh, he's going to get to go home, not to a rehab, on Monday probably. So that was an amazing answer to prayer. Uh, And so uh, God works in so many mighty ways all around us. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Sometimes we can because things are sometimes hard and sometimes we're distracted. But don't miss it. God is a mighty God. Heavenly Father, I just praise you. There's so many things to lift up, and I lift them up to you today. Thank you for our community. Uh, It is a great community. It really is. And thank you for letting us be a part of what makes it great, because we're kingdom people, because we believe in you. And so let us keep making that great, because it's you that makes any community great really and um, so thank you for the amazing work you did and thank you for the amazing work that you did in roger we praise you god you're you're an awesome god in jesus we pray amen okay um uh, uh, children you may be leave to go to uh to your preschool uh class and um the rest of you may not be dismissed i'm sorry oh so uh let me just get ready to preach and, and get Facebook up and running, and, and uh, I will, uh, I, I'm moving things around up here, so make sure the camera is going to work. Um, I appreciate you guys um, that, that join us here in person, and I also appreciate those that, that join us on, on Facebook. Um, that's... Uh, a good community to reach to, and sometimes we can't be here. Um, So we're in our fourth uh, of our series. Am I I good to go? Uh, That's 
so unprofessional to stop and say that, but <laughs> so we're in our fourth in our series about hi, hey, by the way, I didn't get a chance to say hi earlier. Good to see you. Um, we're in our fourth in our series on the book of James. And James is a is kind of a a wonderful character. Um, even his contemporaries, some of the historians, named him James the Just. He, he is a character, as we look at his book, I want to see his life. And, and James is, it's not that James wants to be seen. He really wants Jesus to be seen. We saw that right up front in that opening line, James just a servant of Jesus Christ. Just, just a servant of Jesus. But he's always there in, this, in, the, in the Bible, in the background. Kind of like maybe us in, in, in sometimes. We're, we're, we're in the background of the story of Jesus. And, and, and I want us to pause and, and think about what that would have been like for James to be just in the background of, of the life of Jesus. And, and, and the thing about Jesus, or James, excuse me, and, and all of the disciples and all of the characters throughout the New Testament, throughout the Old Testament, it's not a book about Moses. There's not a book about Abraham. It's not a book about Peter. There's not a book about James because James wants you to know that the book is about Jesus. I'm in the background, though. And if you look, you'll see James. James was there. He was the second oldest in the children of Joseph and in, in Mary. He was born sometime after Bethlehem happened. And so he was there as Jesus' little brother. He was there in Nazareth as they were growing up and they were walking together to the synagogue school. He would have been there. He would have been there walking with Jesus and memorizing the Old Testament with Jesus and studying for tests together. He would have been there with the rest of the brothers and the rest of the sisters as they were walking together to the synagogue every single day to learn about God. He would have been there just behind the scenes. He was always there. And then later in the New Testament, we begin to see him in the background again. Later, the focus of the gospel seems to be on the disciples, on the teaching of the twelve and Jesus' interaction with them. It's still about Jesus, not about the twelve. But even then, you can see James in the background. But when we see James in the background, we see that he's struggling. He's struggling with faith, struggling with faith in Jesus. Early on in his life, he must have really looked up to Jesus there. He must have been times when he might have thought, I want to be a rabbi someday. I'd like to teach teachers. Always looking up at Jesus. But in the Gospels, we begin to the glimpses that we begin to see of James is that he's struggling with his faith. That all of Jesus' family are beginning to doubt the stories that they had heard about how God had a special promise and a special work for, for, for Jesus. In fact, if we look just beyond, just in the shadows, we'll see that James... John said, didn't even believe. We see him struggling with how Jesus was acting as, a, as, a, as, as the Messiah, as, as, a, as a man of God, questioning whether or not he should do this or do that. And, and then we see finally this kind of grand finale of a falling out of a family. When we see James struggling with whether Jesus was even sane, as they Tell Jesus, stop preaching. Stop preaching. And then the next time we see James in the background, we see him 
we see him in the church. Now all of a sudden he's been transformed. And, we, and, 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 it's, and it's in the first Corinthians that, that uh, uh, Paul tells us how the transformation takes place. And it's not so different than how our transformation takes place. That James got to see the resurrected living Jesus. And suddenly in that moment that he saw Jesus alive, he suddenly put all the pieces, all the memories of walking to school and sitting in the synagogues and going to the Jerusalem for the, for the, for the feast. All of a sudden, it all came clear to him that Jesus was the Christ. That he had literally grown up with the Messiah, the son of the living God. It all made sense to him. And seemingly in the background we see that he becomes the leader of the first church of Jerusalem. Which by the way we like to say that we're the first church of. Only James was the real first church of. (laughs) <laughs> Jerusalem was the first church of, is the only one. And James pastored that church until, until the same system of hate and the Jewish leaders took his life. But all along he was there, never up front really, always just serving Jesus Because the story is about Jesus. And he was just faithful to the brother he loved. And last week we looked at it. He loved Jesus. And he loved the word of God. Now today, we're in chapter 2. And again, I want to make sure that we see Jesus. James wants us to see Jesus. And he wants us to know, I believe, that what it was like. Now, he doesn't say it in these words, but stick with me. He wants us to know what it's like to grow up with Jesus. I believe that's what he's saying. He believes that growing up is the only real choice if you believe in Jesus. By the way, you're going to grow up whether or not you will believe that or not. You're going to grow up whether you want to or not because you can't stop time. The body's going to grow. Sometimes it's growing, well, it's always growing older. (laughs) Seems like there's a crest up there somewhere. I'm not sure. But you're going to grow whether you believe it or not. You're going to grow either way. You're going to grow. The question that we should have as Christians and the question that I think James's book begs is will you grow up? Will you grow up in your relationship to Jesus? Will it change you? Will it forever make you better? And not leave you the same. You're going to grow either way. You'll either grow up or you'll grow down. But because of Jesus and because we have this opportunity to be with him. He in us and we in him. We know that we get a chance to grow up and become better people. Changed people. Transformed people. Now here's the next part. And it's really not the next part. It's Here's a core belief of James, which I believe is a core belief in the scriptures. And that is that you cannot disconnect your faith from your actions. You cannot disconnect what it means to know Jesus and what it means to act like Jesus. Are you with me? Give me an amen. James is convinced that, there, that, that that's, that's, that's the only way. There is no other way. In spite of the reality that the history of Israel has often been, just read it in the, has often been the story of saying, I believe in God, but worshiping idols. Saying, I believe in the living God, Jehovah, 
But then killing the prophets. In fact, Jesus was a victim of this disconnect that took place between religious people claiming to worship the living God and then when the Messiah comes and leads them to a real relationship with the living God, they think it's okay to kill him. In fact, they, they've gone so far as to say, God told me. That is a huge disconnect. James, over and over throughout his book, he wants you to get connected to the truth. Connected to the truth changes you. It cannot leave you the same. It has to transform you. Now watch. Uh, so, so let me, can I put the central idea here that we sometimes like to, or often like to say together. Let me read it and then you'll read it with me. We grow up with Jesus when we put grace and faith into practice. Now, say that with me. We grow up with Jesus when we put grace and faith into action. Now, I'm going to read the second chapter. Now, that central idea is true of all of James, but I'm going to read it in two parts because I, a second chapter in two parts because I think the first one is that grace and faith, grace and faithfulness are the same thing. And then I think he's going to go on to expound that faith and faithfulness are the same thing. Now watch, stay with me. Let's listen to how James says it in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Let's just read the first 13 verses. My brothers and sisters, believers in our, oh, I love that word, glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not Show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing the fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but you say to the poor man, you stand there, or you sit on the floor at my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom that he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who are exploiting you. Are, are they not the ones who are dragging you into the court? Are, are, are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him whom, to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself." And you are, then you are doing right. If you show favoritism, you sin. And you're convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law, yet stumbles on just one point, is guilty of breaking all of them. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said you should not commit murder. And if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you've become a lawbreaker. Now, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, I want to spend some time here. Grace and graceful are the same thing. I, if I am not judged, then I cannot judge someone else. Did you, did you see the connection? It's a disconnect to think that I've not been judged. I've been given grace. 
but I'm not giving it to you. That's a disconnect. It doesn't make any sense. It's not logical to James or to Spock. It doesn't make sense that what you give, you wouldn't give to others. And it's interesting how he frames it. James is really good at looking behind the scenes at what causes us to sin. Earlier, he said what causes you to, in first chapter, he said what causes you to get angry is because you don't listen. Because you think that your words are more important than their words, and then you get mad because they're not listening to you because you've already demoted their words to not as important as your words, and then you get angry, and then you are not becoming the God, the, the, the righteousness that God had intended for your life. James looks behind the scene to see what causes us to sin. In this one, he takes us and says, you know what causes you to judge one another? It's this thing of favoritism. And it's fascinating what he does. He takes us to a, a, a hypothetical situation that probably wasn't that hypothetical. He takes us to church. But remember, Jesus and, and, and James grew up in a synagogue. What was in James's mind? Did he remember a time when he and Jesus was in the synagogue growing up and, and, and some big shot out of Jesus? Judea, Jerusalem came and everybody fawned all over them as they told Jesus and James or somebody poorer than them to shut up and be quiet and sit over to the side. Maybe he was there the day that Jesus would have said or coined the phrase, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes by greeting and be greeted with respect in the marketplace and have, and, and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. But listen, they devour widows' houses and for a show they make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished severely. Was he there? The day Jesus coined that phrase, watch out for the Pharisees. Had the Pharisees taken advantage of his mother, who was likely a widow, at some point? James looks at a hypothetical, but it's not that hypothetical. I think it's a real-life example that's always present. The idea that we would show favoritism that we would judge. Now, here's, here's what he does, though. He reverses it. He's, James's mind, the Holy Spirit, is working mightily in him as he remembers what he learned in the Old Testament and as he remembers what he learned from Jesus. He reverses it, and he says, you know what the problem is? The problem is not that you, not that you judge people by looking down on them, but deep down, you judge people by looking up to them. Now, now think about that. And you wonder, I'm, I'm watching a, a documentary now about a, another of the many horrible cults that are modern day part of our history. How, how did a cult leader be able to manipulate like that? Because somebody looked at them and, and, and judged them as better than them. See, it's not just that you judge people as beneath you. It's the whole idea that you might judge somebody above you as better than you. And then he says, deep down, you begin to think about what would be best for you. To look up to them or to look down on somebody else. What would be best for your church? I've heard church leaders say, go to the successful and the wealthy and, and, and show them great honor because they'll be your givers. James says, you're guilty of judging. Not just when you look down your nose at people, but when you honor them as if somehow they're better than you or better than those people down here. And he says, when you do that, you sin. Isn't it 
amazing what James does? It's easy to pick out the times we look down at somebody because I've, I'm more successful or I've accomplished, conquered that sin. But he says, you start to do that when you look up and you elevate people to statures and places that they have no place being. Why? Because, because it's not how God looks at people. How God looks at people, he says, is by the royal law. He says what God does is he says, you love everybody the same because God looks at everybody the same. He loves you when you're here. He loves you when you're here. The basis by which we look at our world is based on how we love them. And how we saw God love them. Again, if you've been given the grace and the love of Jesus, you have to give it too. It's not a measuring who's here and who's there. It's how you love everybody the same and how you show grace to everybody. Here's the, here's the word that, that I think that, that I'd like to make sure I say right. The problem with judging is not looking down on people you think are under you, but looking up to people that you think are better than you and measuring people by anything other than God's love, he says, is a sin. Now, now stay with me here. We've got another one to do, but, but I want to make sure we talk about this one enough. I want to make sure that we heard, James, that we hear the Holy Spirit. Grace and gracefulness are the same thing. And, and, and here's what he does. He says, he, says uh, he, he takes the royal law, and I'm note the royal law, um, and then note his example. He says, the royal law is to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, now put that in the context. Um, I think he's quoting his, his big brother. It's true that that's in Leviticus. It was mentioned one time in the group of 300 and some laws. But it was Jesus, when he was asked, what, what, what's the whole, what's, 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 what's all of it mean? Could, could you tell us what it all boils down to? It was Jesus that said, love the Lord your God. He took the first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, with all of your mind. And then he said this. It was Jesus that did this. Seven different times, according to the gospel writer. It was Jesus that said, and the second one is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. They're inseparable. What you feel about God, what you think about God, and what you've received from God, and what you give to others are not two different things. It was Jesus that James heard say that this is the same thing as this. It's one commandment, not two. It's, it, it's all the same thing. What you get, you, re, you give. When you get the love of God, you give out the love of God. When you get the grace of God, you give out the grace of God. It's one thing, not two. Don't get those disconnected. Don't, that's the devil's playground. To get us to disconnect something that's the same thing and make it different. Jesus said they're the same thing. It's, it's, it's all one. They're all woven together. Um, and then he does this, and, and let, me, let me try to make sense of this, or make sure that we, we've made sense of it, because he gives the illustration about the... About, he, now remember, he says that... He says if you're guilty of committing adultery, but not guilty of murder, you're still guilty. If you're guilty of murder, but and here's what here's and sometimes we Christians get this a little muddy. James doesn't seem to have a problem with it. I'm he is not saying that you don't make moral judgments. The whole context of what he's saying is, of course you make moral judgments. Of course you you know the Bible said you shouldn't commit adultery. That doesn't change because of grace. That, that's the law that makes you free. That's, that's, a, that's a moral law. That's a, that's a moral reality that sets you free. Free to, 
to keep from the pain that happens when, 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 when we disobey that. And then he says, commit adultery we, 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 or, or commit murder. But, but, so he's not saying we don't make moral judgments or that we don't make distinctions between what is good and what is not and what is holy and what is impure and what is, what is righteous and what is unrighteous, what is sin and what is non-sin. He's not saying that at all. He's saying, yeah, you have to make those moral judgments and you better be making them because if you don't, you, you'll get hurt. But what he's saying is that loving each other is just as important as not murdering. <laughs> he's elevating this the royal law. That didn't we do that as Christians? We think sometimes as long as I don't commit adultery, as long as I don't commit a, a, a murder anybody, as long as I keep the Ten Commandments, I can be as mean and hateful and judgmental as I want. James says, no, what, what? any time you do what is unrighteous with each other, any time you judge one another when you weren't judged, you make, a, you make that sin. Are you with me? Amen. That could transform a lot of things in our lives and in our minds and in Christianity and in our world if we could just get that right. It's not either or. It's 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 learning that what it means to, to to not to look at people the way Jesus does. And if we've been given grace, we need to give grace. And it's not the same as saying that there is no sin, because we know there is. We know because we felt it. Are you with me? I'm sometimes I'm not sure. If you don't get a little more vocal, I won't be. I won't know. <clears throat> Listen to me, because I got another one to do. James now goes into the same thing about not getting something connected. This time he gets very specific about faith and faithfulness. And watch how he does it. And, um, and then I want to I look into it a little deeper. In the latter part of that same chapter, beginning in chapter 14, or excuse me, chapter, chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it? My brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith, but he has no deeds, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds. I'll show you my faith with my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. But even demons believe that. And they shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham concerned righteous, uh, uh, considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac at the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. The scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, not by faith alone in the same way was not Rahab and the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off to different directions as the body without the spirit is dead so faith without deeds is dead 
Now, now let's take that apart just a little bit to make sure. I mean, you can't say it much clearer or plainer, but, but, but he believes that faith and faithfulness are the same thing. You cannot disconnect them. It's not either or. They're the same thing. It's, it's, it's the same. Faith in Jesus to, that saves you is not different than faithfulness. Let me say that again. Faith in Jesus that saves us is not different than faithfulness. It is a dangerous disconnect that think that they're two different things. If you pry them apart, there's no transformation. There's no growing up. There's no second generation. There's no growing in Christ. The gospel stops in the first generation if it was just something you think about. And note this, that James even takes it a second farther. It's not just thinking and acting. By the way, he thinks that thinking, it, he thinks you will actually do whatever you think. That, that, that's kind of his basic issue. Is you will actually do what you think. You may say on Sunday morning, I believe in Jesus. But what you do on Monday will be determined by what you really think. And then he adds to it, it's just fascinating to me, that, that he takes it a step farther. And in his hypothetical, which isn't that hypothetical, he would have seen that in his life and in the life of Christ. In his hypothetical, he says, if you say to someone, see, you take it a step farther. Not only do you think that Jesus, your faith but you also speak it. And he gives us a hypothetical of someone who said it. You be blessed. God be with you. And then didn't do anything about it. <laughs> so, so not only did you think it and not do it, but now you're bold enough to say it and still not do it. Don't wear a t-shirt if you're not going to do it. Make sure you're doing what that T-shirt says. And, 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 and he's showing that this, this, there's this huge disconnect, right? And, 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 and we, you can't disconnect them. And by the way, Jesus never wanted to disconnect actions. But, and it's something we kind of miss in our culture, I think, or, or in our Bible teaching or something. But when you say, I want to follow you, Jesus... When a disciple becomes a disciple, he was never supposed to just learn what his master thought. Look through the New Testament. Look through that story of the 12 in the background. They were never thinking they would just learn to think like Jesus. They always thought they were learning to do what Jesus does. It's never phrased any other way than learning to do, think it, God is love. God wants to redeem. God wants to restore. And now you do what faith does. It's, it was never different. That's the reason why on two different occasions, in order to punctuate it, the gospel writer said, Jesus sent out the 12. Then later, right before he went to Jerusalem, just a few weeks before his death, he sent out 72. And this is what he said to do. Go to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim the message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. And then heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy and drive out demons. And freely give as you have received freely. Get it? There it is. It's not disconnected. You, 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 if, you, if you get it, you give it. If you believe it, you do it. James said there's no difference. That's why he came to them and said, and said that when, when he, when they, a second time, there's two. Uh, that's why John tells us there were two of them. Uh, there are two times that, that he fed people, the 5,000. And the second time, because they had already done it once. The second time that he gets ready to do it, the disciples come to him and say, Jesus, these guys are, are hungry and, and you're going to have to send them home. And Jesus says to them, remember, you feed them. Because we do what Jesus did. 
Whatever it is that we get from Jesus, we give it that way. Because it's not different. They're the same thing. Everything that happens on the inside happens on the outside too. Do you get that? Everything that happens on the inside happens on the outside too. Can I get a big amen? Because that would fix a lot of the brokenness that we're feeling. Because James thinks that if you get disconnected from these truths, that it's a painful life. That the kingdom of God does not go out and that you don't feel, live the thing that you were supposed to live. That's why sometimes as Christians we're disconnected. We, we, we're disconnected from, from, from the truth and from reality. And then he says, I love this part, he says, you fools. And it's a hypothetical. Um, I don't know that he's name calling, but he is pretty blunt. By the way, Jesus said, you fools, seven different times. So he must have heard Jesus saying that. And so in his hypothetical, he recognizes there's some people that have done it. That have thought it, but not done it. Or said it and not done it. And he says, that's foolish. That would be foolish. And the word he uses is different than the word Jesus uses. I, I think it's interesting. He, his word for that's translated foolish is actually more translated or often translated empty. You're an empty man. If you think that thinking it and not doing it is not disconnected. And then he does this amazing thing. He, he, he gives these two examples. Now stay with me. I'm almost done. He gives these two examples. And he takes this example. He couldn't have used a better example because he takes Abraham. Abraham to the Jewish converts that he actually said he was writing his letter to. Believers in Jesus who had come from Judaism. He takes Abraham and he says, now you take Abraham. The Bible clearly says in chapter 12, I believe it's chapter 12 of Genesis. It says, or chapter 15, verse 6, it says, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He says, he takes up Abraham and he says, he, he says they, that God clearly said that it was credited to him as righteousness because he, because he believed. But he takes up that Abraham and he says, are you, are you serious? Did you not notice? Did you not notice that everything he believed he actually did? did? Did you not memorize like me and Jesus did at the synagogue? Did you not know that, that, that if you knew chapter 15, verse 66, you probably know chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. And that same audience that heard him also knew that they knew this. And just three verses later, it says, so Abraham went where the Lord had told him. Did you see it? It's never different. They're always the same thing. And, and I have this sentence, and I, I don't know if we got this up yet or not, but I, 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 I coined this phrase. There is no crediting without the editing of his course of life based on what he believed. Did you see that? We don't have it up there, so look at me. I, I'm going to say it again. Thank you very much. There is no crediting without the editing of our course based on what we believe. Wow. That's what James is trying to say. You can't disconnect those two things. And we see a lot of, I'm going to say it, but a lot of Christianity wants to separate those out. And James says they're not two things. They're one thing. What you get, you receive. Grace. What you believe, you do. Faith. That's what it is. And I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna I'm gonna close. I um, I need to close. Um, but James is, amazes me at his understanding of this thing of getting disconnected and how disconnecting keeps you from growing in your faith, growing with Jesus. And, and, and I know that if you really work hard on this word, you can probably find some places where it's a positive. 
may, sometimes maybe we be to get disconnected from some of our friends that are dragging us down. Sometimes we may need to get disconnected from, from a habit that's dragging us down. But James recognizes something that brain scientists have even figured out. But James was way ahead of his time. He recognized that when you disconnect a truth, and you try to parse it out and to make it to make to make, make it two different things when it's one thing that that's a disconnect that will take away from life. By the way, you know that's disconnect, right? You know in your brain. So, uh, one of my favorite authors has wrote a book on 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 this, and 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 there's seven. I think there's seven lobes. I should have lobes. I should should have went. Uh, you can't disconnect any of the seven lobes, but there's still one brain. And they're all working together to bring health. But the moment you disconnect a brain injury here or a brain injury there or, 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 or something went wrong in the chemical processes that was feeding it or something went wrong, a tragedy in your life that causes you to disconnect some part of your brain and all of a sudden you got something disconnected in the way you think that will take away from life. We call it disorders now, and we recall it to multiple personalities, or or we have other names for it, like disassociated. And, and but all it means is the same thing: that your brain all works together to do one thing. And when it's not working together, then it doesn't make sense. And Je- Jesus comes along and says, "Get connected to the truth. Don't disconnect the reality that if you believe, you do." There's no dysfunction there. And it only works, the church only works when you got that right. It's a dysfunctional church that doesn't, that thinks that what you do on Sunday has nothing to do with what you do on Monday. It's a dysfunctional church that thinks that you can lift up and, and tell somebody to, to be blessed and not be a part of the solutions. You, you, it's a dysfunctional Christianity that does that. And that's not a healthy Christian mind. It's not a healthy Christian church. James saw Jesus, something that was totally connected, that the believing and doing was all the same. And that's, that's, that's the thing. It's not healthy, guys, if we don't get this right. Not healthy for the next generation that's looking for answers. And it's really not healthy for us either. Heavenly Father, I love you and praise you. I thank you for the, the, for the, for the profoundness of, of, of how your spirit was working through this man who, who wants us to see Jesus and to understand what that really means and how transformative that is to grow up with Jesus. So my prayer is that we would read James deeply and that the Spirit would cause us to get connected to the truth that saves us and saves others. That's my prayer. And I thank you for letting us be a part of it today in the body of Christ to grow up with Jesus this very day. And Jesus, I pray it. Amen.